By this point in the Stalingrad campaign, Paulus's 6th Army had cleared Soviet forces from most of the Don Bend, and had managed to get some divisions across the Don. Now, the immediate objective of Wittesheim's 14th Panzer Corps was to race to the Volga north of Stalingrad in order to cut the city off from receiving supplies and reinforcements coming from the north. So, at 0430 hours on the 23rd of August 1942, Huber's 16th Panzer Division and Schlomer's 3rd Motorized Division burst from their bridgehead at Vertiachi, shattering the Soviet lines within 15 minutes. The 98th Rifle Division, with the 87th Rifle Division's 1,382nd Rifle Regiment and the 137th Tank Brigade, had little chance of resisting this onslaught. The 98th Rifle Division basically dissolved, and the other units fell back south. Above the advancing panzers, Henschel 129 fighter bombers provided effective tank-destroying support, reportedly taking out many Soviet tanks before the German ground troops had even got to them. In fact, in addition to hitting the city of Stalingrad, as described in the previous episode, another 1,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Soviet troops directly ahead of 6th Army's advance, paralysing the Soviet side on this day. These air attacks were so devastating that they caused the 87th Rifle Division's two reinforcing regiments to scatter, preventing them from offering any resistance to the 16th Panzer Division as the Panzers drove along a high ridge south of Kotleban. They came to the Stalingrad K defensive line. However, because the 87th Rifle Division had been ordered to move forwards, they had abandoned this defensive position, meaning the 16th Panzer Division was able to drive right across the unmanned line without any trouble at all. This was an enormous break for the Germans. Yes, the only part of the Stalingrad defensive lines that the Germans would face during this initial advance had been abandoned, and it's not clear who had made the decision for the 87th Rifle Division to advance, leaving the line unmanned. It was either Yeremenka or Lopatin, or both, but whoever it was, this was a colossal error and a major blunder for the Soviet side. The Germans would now face little opposition until they got to the Volga, whereas they could have been stalled or halted, much like Hot had been, in the face of a manned defensive line. If the enemy had turned even two divisions along the railway line southward from Kony, they could easily have reached Voropanovo Station at the rear of the 62nd and 64th Armies, and could have cut them off from the city. So, without anything to stop them, the Panzers, now led by Kampfgruppe Strachwitz, rolled over the railway line near Konya Station, where they shot up several Soviet trains. These trains were carrying the 2nd Tank Corps Reconnaissance Battalion, as well as its 148th Tank Brigade, and were blown to pieces by the German guns. The reconnaissance battalion's commander and commissar were killed, along with many of their troops. At the same time, 3rd Motorized Division's spearhead reached 564th Kilometer Station, where they captured a train as it was in the process of unloading its cargo. Inside this train was 20 US lend lease trucks, which they incorporated into their units. A warning came in from 6th Army's headquarters telling 3rd Motorized Division that the 28th Tank Corps was near Kotleban village. Schlomer was eating pea soup as a forward squadron of five Soviet tanks attacked from this unit. Schlomer was caught off guard, but luckily survived the attack and the Germans fought the Soviets off. A second counterattack on 564th Kilometer Station was conducted by a regiment from Glazkov's 35th Guards Rifle Division, supported by 16 tanks from the 169th Tank Brigade. Major Semenov was killed in the process, and the Soviets took heavy losses. 
Guriev's 39th Guards, with the 214th Rifle Division, also attacked the 384th Infantry Division in a desperate attempt to slow them down. But despite inflicting over 130 casualties on the Germans, they were repulsed and the 384th Infantry Division was able to expand its bridgehead. The 389th Infantry Division also deflected the 32nd Motorized Rifle Brigade and slowly gained ground as well. Now, the Soviets had previously reacted to the German attacks by ordering several divisions to the Stalingrad area. The problem was that most of these divisions would arrive either the day after the 23rd or the day after that, far too late to do anything on the 23rd itself. However, one division had arrived. Well, sort of. The Siberian 315th Rifle Division had been ordered to move south, and its three rifle regiments were currently marching in columns over the steppe, directly in the face of the German spearhead. They were not in combat positions, and their leading regiment was much further forward than the others. So, the 16th Panzer Division continued to roll northeast through the practically unmanned Stalingrad S2 defensive line. They then rolled over the ancient Tartar Trench, a natural anti tank ditch which, again, was hardly manned by the Soviets, and then they moved towards the Volga. In the process, they cut off the forward regiment of the 315th Rifle Division from the rest of the division to the north and the 3rd Motorized Division's 8th Infantry Regiment also removed some weak Soviet forces from the Tartar Ditch and took Kosmichi in hut-to-hut -hut fighting. It was in the early afternoon that the city of Stalingrad came into sight. Apart from the chimneys of the city, the tractor factory was visible to Huber's men, even at this distance. Tank commanders tensed when they saw church steeples and white houses on the horizon. Clutching their throat microphones, they told their crews, on the right is Stalingrad. The men clambered up for a look at the montage of homes, bulkers and smokestacks that passed beside them, and cheers echoed along the column. Then shells erupted around the lead tanks, and they buttoned up for a fight. At 1500 hours, Kampfgruppe Strachwitz approached the Volga River north of Stalingrad. Young civilian women manned the anti-aircraft guns ahead of them. These girls had only recently graduated from school and had been given no weapons training and only basic instructions. And now they were caught in a dilemma. Should they fire at the German aircraft circling above them, or should they fire at the panzers? Well, some decided to fire into the sky whilst others lowered their guns and opened fire at Strachwitz's tanks. The Soviets claimed that 28 German tanks were taken out, but the Germans reported that almost all of the shots missed their targets, and it seems that the Soviet batteries were quickly surrounded and after some fierce fighting, which in some cases may have lasted into the night, whilst supported by Stukas, Strachwitz overwhelmed the gun positions. The girls had died by their guns, a fact that apparently appalled Strachwitz's men when they discovered that they'd been fighting young girls, not other men. They were also of the opinion that they were schoolgirls, not women. The Russians still find this squeamishness curiously illogical, considering that Richthofen's bombers had killed many thousands of women and children in Stalingrad that very same afternoon. Although there are conflicting accounts, it appears that Strachwitz's tank was the first to reach the bank of the Volga at 1700 hours, followed by the rest of the 16th Panzer Division. Some of the men got down from their vehicles, took off their uniforms and jumped into the water and had a bath. Considering that the weather was hot and that they were covered in dust and grime as they drove across the steppe, this was no doubt a welcomed respite. And by evening, Huber's men, along with Wiedersheim's 14th Panzer Corps headquarters, had set up a hedgehog-type defence in the area. 
Schlomer's division, which had captured 888 prisoners, had destroyed 17 Soviet tanks and hundreds more vehicles for the cost of just one casualty, had set up another hedgehog defence around the Kuzmichi area, leaving a 3 kilometer gap between Schlomer's and Huber's divisions. And, as usual, Paulus's mobile forces had outrun their supporting infantry divisions. So there was no connection between Wiedersheim's 14th Panzer Corps and Heitz's 8th Army Corps, though it appears that the Soviets hadn't yet fully closed the gap. Heitz and Seidlitz had expanded their bridgehead, and the 76th Infantry Division was the nearest Axis division to Wiedersheim's corps, having reached the Rosorska River area. But it was still several kilometers to the west of 3rd Motorized Division's units. The 60th Motorized Division wouldn't fully cross the Don until the next morning, and was currently in a giant traffic jam stretching from behind the river to the village of Borodin. But even though they couldn't get supplies, they could communicate with the German High Command. And late that evening, Hitler himself radioed Huber's division, saying, 16th Panzer Division will hold its positions in all circumstances. Caught off guard by this dash to the Volga, the Stalingrad Defense Committee desperately tried to set up some form of defense. Students in the area continued to dig trenches under fire from the 16th Panzer Division, whilst the committee ordered all factories to form workers' battalions to protect their workshops inside the city. In factory courtyards up and down the main north-south highway in Stalingrad, political commissars and foremen processed thousands of workers for duty. They told each group, whoever can bear arms and whoever can shoot, write your names down. Those who signed got a white armband, a rifle and a bandolier of ammunition before they moved off in platoons to the riverbank. Workers not selected went to the settlement houses to alert relatives of those who had gone into the lines. Firemen, railwaymen, office workers, and even women and children, if you believe Chirikov, became soldiers. And a thousand of these militiamen were sent to the southern bank of the Mokraya Mechchetka River to take up defensive positions in the face of the German panzers. Ammunition and rifles were distributed, but many men received a weapon only after a comrade was killed. Militia infantry, of course, wouldn't be enough. So they were quickly reinforced with 30 tanks and some anti-tank guns, all of which were manned by the very workers who had made or repaired them. These tanks lacked gun sights, meaning that they had to be aimed by looking down the barrel of the gun, which is clearly not ideal when you're going up against experienced German panzer formations. Also, overnight, the 282nd Rifle Regiment of Zarayev's 10th NKVD Rifle Division was sent to assist as well. There were very few Red Army soldiers in the city at this time. Most were still retreating from the Don, and Stalingrad was defended by regiments of NKVD and hastily recruited workers' battalions. Zarayev was effectively commander of Stalingrad. Lopatin, meanwhile, had had to abandon his original plans for counterattacks, partly in order to shore up his defences in the north and the approaches to Stalingrad, but partly because some of his units had already been defeated, and some of his units were simply unprepared to launch such attacks. To paint a grim picture of the situation, from west to east along the northern part of the corridor was 4th Tank Army's 214th Rifle Division and the remnants of its 39th Guards Rifle Division. Then they had the dregs of the 62nd Army's 98th Rifle Division, which had barely 300 men at this point and no heavy equipment. Further east, there were the two northern regiments of the 4th Tank Army's 87th Rifle Division, since the 3rd Regiment had been cut off to the south. Then there was the newly formed 35th Guards Rifle Division, which had a lack of heavy equipment, no rear organization to speak of, and the troops only had the ammunition which they had carried to the front, no more. 
And finally, there were the two northern regiments of the 315th Rifle Division, since, again, its final regiment was also cut off to the south. From them to the Volga, there was basically nothing of note on the Soviet side at this moment in time. And south of the corridor, between the 196th Rifle Division on the K defensive line and the 10th MKVD Division's positions, there were only the few scattered rifle regiments that had been cut off from their divisions to the north, and the 2nd Tank Corps, which had been split in two during the day. Clearly, the Soviets would have a difficult time maintaining the line, let alone counterattacking and actually cutting the German corridor. That said, Kravchenko's 2nd Tank Corps, or at least the southern half of it, was now ordered to move to the Gumrak area in preparation for a counterattack. And the newly arrived 27th Guards Rifle Division moved to the front in the evening to strike into the seam between the 389th and 384th Infantry Divisions. This attack wouldn't fully develop until the next day, but it was further slowing down the German infantry advance, so there was some hope for the Soviets at this time. In his bunker, situated in the Tsaritsa Gorge inside Stalingrad, tensions were extremely high. Yeremenka tried to remain calm in front of his staff as telephones rang constantly. Bombarded by calls and messengers throughout the day, he had no time to do anything else, and his breakfast was left to go cold on his desk. When two generals reported that they had just completed a new pontoon bridge across the Volga inside the city, Yeremenka thanked them both for their hard work, then ordered them to destroy it. This bridge could not be allowed to fall into German hands. And when another general called to report on the situation at the front, Yeremenka snapped. He told him to stop panicking and slammed the phone down. Yet, with the chaos at the front, and with German bombs now raining heavily upon the city outside, to Yeremenka and his staff, it looked like the Germans were about to strike into the city. If they did, Stalingrad could fall. But at the very least, the situation in the south seemed stable. Shumilov's defences at Tingutta Station were substantial. To the south of the station was the 204th Rifle Division, and to the east of the station stood the 138th Rifle Division. Both of these divisions were reinforced by the 56th Tank Brigade, some additional mortar units, and an artillery machine gun battalion from the 118th Fortified Region. The defences north of the station, blocking the 14th Panzer Division, consisted of the 154th Naval Rifle Brigade, the 20th Destroyer Brigade, and the 133rd Tank Brigade, supported by the 186th and 665th Anti-Tank Artillery Regiments. Clearly, this was going to be a tough nut to crack, especially since there were still Soviet units in the Malaya Tingutta River area, which the 29th Motorized Division was now ordered to clear. At 0400 hours, Kampf Group Ulig attacked westwards, whilst 129th Panzer Battalion and Sturber's 3rd Battalion from the 71st Infantry Regiment set off at 0630 hours, also heading west. At 0545 hours, Edelsheim was attacked by a couple of battalions of Soviet troops, but the attack was defeated by the concentrated artillery fire of 89th Panzer Artillery Regiment. Still, this action delayed the start of Edelsheim's next attack, which aimed to clear the southern shore of Lake Sarpa. Nonetheless, his men did move into the reeds and mud to complete their task. Bullets brushed through the long grass or thwacked into the soft ground, forcing the riflemen into the mud. A light machine gun quickly brought into position soared through the tall reeds, more often than not striking a Russian poised only a dozen or so meters from the Germans. Meanwhile, being hit on three sides, Broich was in a difficult position. And, despite having already decided to withdraw from Hill 118, Kempf now changed his mind and ordered Broich to hold on. This was because 14th Panzer Division was aiming to move up on the left flank of 24th Panzer Division, so reinforcements were on their way. And 14th Panzer Division's advance 
eased the pressure on Broich's troops. In fact, Broich's men were now enjoying a temporary respite. They were a little too complacent though, because as some of the men were lying on top of their panzers reading letters from home, there was a sudden Soviet artillery strike, and their commander, Oberst Riebel, was killed. Word soon spread throughout 24th Panzer Division, the news of Oberst Riebel's death producing a feeling of great loss amongst the officers and men. No one in the division was really qualified enough to take over command of the regiment, so Major von Winterfeld, commander of the 1st Battalion, took up the position as a new regiment commander was found elsewhere in the army. Meanwhile, by 1730 hours, the two groups of 29th Motorized Division had reached each other in the area southeast of 74 km station, clearing out the Soviet positions in the process. 129th Panzer Battalion had lost five panzers in this action, but 29th Motorized Division as a whole had taken nearly 1,200 prisoners. So the day had been a success. That said, they were unable to take 74 km station, and the Soviets halted any further advance. As another testament to the fighting in the south, by this point 24th Panzer Division's panzer strength had ebbed to just 54 tanks, which is really bad considering it had had 94 tanks on the 18th of August, just five days before. And Shumilov's defence in the Tingutta station area had still not been cracked. In fact, it looked like a stalemate was about to grip the front once more. So any suggestion that the Soviets weren't putting up much resistance, or that the Germans had an easy ride until they got into the city of Stalingrad itself, simply doesn't hold up to scrutiny. And to the west, 63rd and 21st Armies managed to counterattack along the Don River, tying down German forces. Having reinforced their lines with the Chela Ray Division, a battalion from the Pasubio, and the German 179th Infantry Regiment, the Italians decided to mount a counterattack against the Soviet bridgehead west of Serafimovich. The tables had turned against the Soviets, with the 14th Guards Rifle Division taking heavy casualties, including the loss of some of their battalion commanders. The division was forced back, and Gryaznov only restored his line thanks to copious amounts of artillery fire. Still, the Soviets remained on the southern bank of the Don, and were now trying to reinforce the bridgehead. Plieve's 3rd Guards Cavalry Corps, which consisted of three cavalry divisions, so was actually a corps-level unit, unlike Soviet tank corps, was now in the process of crossing over the river. And the 203rd Rifle Division was on its way as well. In addition, Moskalenka was attacking in the Kletskaya and Kremenskaya areas. 11th Army Corps, 376th Infantry and 100th Jäger Divisions, suffering sizable casualties, were gradually being pushed back by the 41st, 38th and 40th Guards Rifle Divisions. And yet, while the German High Command did acknowledge the existence of these bridgeheads, they didn't seem to be overly concerned by them. Nor were they sending additional reinforcements to the area, and instead were relying upon local reserves, 22nd Panzer Division, in order to deal with these bridgeheads. The battles on the left wing of the 6th Army are going back and forth. All is relatively quiet on the Don front all the way back to Voronezh. Clearly though, if the Germans didn't secure their side of the Don, the Soviets would have some good bridgeheads in order to mount future offensives. Future offensives which might cause the Germans some real trouble. Because communications had been severed, Vasilevsky had only managed to send two short reports that evening via radio to Moscow. But upon hearing the reports that the Germans had broken through the lines and had reached the Volga, Stalin was furious. He cursed at his commanders and told them, The enemy has broken our front with insignificant force. You have quite enough men at your disposal to destroy enemy units which have broken through. Assemble the planes of both fronts and throw them in against the enemy. Mobilize an armoured train and use it on the circular railway around Stalingrad. Use plenty of smoke screens to confuse the enemy. Jab into the breakthrough units by day and also by night. Use all your artillery and Katusha resources. 
The most important thing is not to let panic take hold. Do not be afraid of the enemy thrusts and keep your faith in our ultimate success. Joseph Stalin. Of course, by this point in the Stalingrad campaign, most of Lopatin's rifle divisions were mere shadows of their former selves. According to Glantz, they now only had two to three thousand men each, rather than having the ten thousand three hundred men that they should have had if they were at full strength. Realising that his depleted units were far too weak to hold the line, Lopatin sent messages to Yeremenka and the Red Army General Staff, asking them for permission to withdraw. He wouldn't receive a reply at this stage, but Lopatin was asking to withdraw in the face of superior forces, as Stalin was saying the enemy force was insignificant and calling for the destruction of the enemy. So, while the Soviet commanders were in conflict with themselves, at dawn on the 24th of August, Paulus's forces continued to attack Lopatin's remnants. Zeidlitz's 51st Army Corps, with the 76th and 295th Infantry Divisions, pushed the Soviets back to the village of Sokarevka by the mid-afternoon, and it now looked like the 399th Rifle Division would be encircled. In fact, if they carried on much further, the German infantry might even penetrate into the 62nd and 64th Army's rear areas, which would have been a disaster for the Soviets. Lopatin reacted by ordering the 33rd Guards Rifle Division and the 157th Separate Artillery Machine Gun Battalion westwards to help form a line between Novo Alexeyevsky and the Don River. Yet, despite this collapse in the centre of his line, Yeremenko's attention seems to have been focused on the critical situation to the north. Here, Wietersheim's 14th Panzer Corps had sliced through and had carved a corridor that split the southeastern front from the Stalingrad front to the north. From the German perspective, Soviet forces to the south of the corridor were deemed to be pretty weak. Therefore, the Germans faced the majority of their units northwards, which was where they guessed that the main threat would come from. This was why the northern front of the German corridor was a continuous line, while the southern front wasn't. It was only dotted by individual strongpoints. Of course, the only Soviet forces facing these strongpoints were some militia units, and the 282nd NKVD Rifle Regiment of Zarev's 10th NKVD Rifle Division. Well, when Stalin was informed that two of his tank corps had just gotten lost and hadn't stopped the Germans from reaching the Volga, he wasn't amused. He ordered Yeremenka and Vasilevsky to counterattack, re-establish a connection between the two fronts, and encircle Wietersheim's corps. Therefore, the deputy commander of the Stalingrad front, Kovalenka, was hastily dispatched to form a shock group to the north of the German corridor. Group Kovalenka would eventually muster three rifle divisions, the 35th Guards Rifle Division, supported by the 169th Tank Brigade, and the 4th and 16th Tank Corps under its command. Their goal was to strike south to cut the German corridor and isolate the 16th Panzer Division and parts of 3rd Motorized Division in an eastern pocket. Stevnev, chief of Stalingrad Front's armoured and mechanised forces, was also sent to form another shock group south of the corridor. Group Stevnev consisted of Kravchenko's 2nd Tank Corps and the remnants of Kazhin's 23rd Tank Corps, which was just one brigade at this point, the 189th Tank Brigade, since elements of the corps had been cut off to the north of the corridor. With these approximately 225 tanks, Stevnev was tasked with attacking from the Yalovka region, aiming for Yazovka. On paper, these were huge forces, with 350 tanks in total and a lot of infantry. Yet, to say that this was a hastily planned attack would be an understatement. Kovalenka went onto the attack barely five hours after receiving the order to do so, which was simply not enough time to properly prepare for it. In addition, his units suffered from both poor leadership and problematic communications, aggravated by the lack of time. Worse, based on a OKW report, it seems that only a portion of the Soviet tanks actually attacked on the 24th. And indeed, both the 4th and 16th tank corps hadn't arrived yet. So, once again, Soviet forces would go onto the offensive in a piecemeal fashion. Nonetheless, desperate times called for desperate measures, and the attack was started. 
Overnight, on the 23rd to 24th of August, the 35th Guards Rifle Division, supported by the 169th Tank Brigade, marched south from Samofolovka and wheeled westwards to reach Malaya Roshoshka, linking up with the 196th Rifle Division. In addition, the 1378th and 1379th Rifle Regiments from the 87th Rifle Division, the two regiments which had been scattered by German bombers the previous day, moved south into the area between Hill 137.2 and Borodkin Farm, with one regiment facing east and the other facing west. These moves cut Wiedersheim's spearhead off from the rest of the 6th Army, placing the 16th Panzer Division and the 3rd Motorized Division in a 29km wide by 8km deep pocket beside the Volga. Actually, it was not a secure stopper that had been inserted between the 14th and 51st Corps, but a piece of territory disputed by the two sides about 6 kilometers wide. Neither Soviet nor German units were able to reliably occupy this space without weakening their positions along other sectors. Because it was a no-man's land, the only way for supply columns to reliably deliver supplies to Wietersheim's core was for them to be accompanied by panzer escort. And the only panzers available to mount a supply convoy escort were the panzers of the 160th Panzer Battalion, which were currently in the area northwest of Zapadnovka, along with other elements of Coloman's 60th Motorized Division, that hadn't made it into the pocket. Paulus therefore ordered 160th Panzer Battalion to move up and support Vitesheim. And at first, they headed east, taking Hill 137.2, in order to get through to the trapped forces. But because the 98th Rifle Division, supported by the 134th Tank Brigade, were giving the 76th Infantry Division a hard time to the north, and there were problems at Zapatinovka, 160th Panzer Battalion and other infantry elements were now diverted south to help them out, leaving Wiedersheim to fend for himself. By this point, the 169th Tank Brigade and Kozirev's 1st Rifle Battalion had captured Zapadinovka. However, they may have run out of ammunition at this point, and if that's true, it's no wonder then that this combined arms attack from the north completely crushed them. Kozirev's 1st Battalion lost all their company commanders, he lost his commissar, and suffered 858 casualties, basically his entire unit. There were only 33 survivors left. Also mortally wounded here was Senior Lieutenant Ruben Ruiz Ibaruri, the son of the Secretary General of the Spanish Communist Party, Dolores Ibaruri. But the 160th Panzer Battalion couldn't move on, since there were no infantry from either 76th Infantry or 60th Motorized Divisions to secure the area. With a breakthrough no longer viable, 60th Motorized Division now formed a hedgehog defense of artillery, anti-tank and machine guns for the evening, confirming their failure to reach Wietersheim's forces that day. Inside the pocket, Kampf Group Krumpen advanced south in an attempt to capture Spartakovka. But Stalingrad civilians and militia had dug primitive trenches and strong points in the area and now used them to offer surprisingly strong counter fire against the Germans. Somehow they managed to halt them, which was when Group Shetevnev advanced. First, the 26th and 27th Tank Brigades of 2nd Tank Corps moved northeast, managing to recapture Orlovka and drove the Germans back to the heights to the north of it. Then, later that evening, the 26th Tank Brigade drove southeast, throwing Krumpen out of Spartakovka, and continued on to retake Renok as well. It's worth noting that the recapture of Olovka, Spartakovka, and Renok are actually quite important events, even though it may not seem like it right now. And, as the fighting at the Volga was going on, General Major Alexander Novikov of the Red Army Air Force High Command arrived at the Stalingrad front for an inspection of the airfields in the area. His report was quite damning of the Soviet Air Force. Despite having been ordered to form in early August, the 16th Air Army still hadn't formed. 
mainly due to the chaos of the unfolding crisis. While obsolete Soviet aircraft had largely been replaced by newer versions, the pilots were completely lacking in experience or training. Most had less than 20 hours flight time before being thrown into a cockpit and told to attack. This left the Soviet 8th Air Army as the only real entity in the air. And since the Germans enjoyed almost total air superiority at this point, 8th Air Army had little choice but to concentrate almost all of what little it had on interdicting German supply trucks that were attempting to get through to Wietersheim's spearhead. Desperate times indeed. And with the Germans still at the Volga, and the Soviets desperate to throw them back, more reinforcements were being sent in from the north. Pavelkin's 16th Tank Corps had been travelling to the region anyway, and was planning to unload in the area southwest of Stalingrad. But now they received the order to unload early, which they did, scattering themselves over a 70 kilometer area along the railway line en route to Stalingrad. Still, they were on the way to the front, as was Mishulin's 4th Tank Corps. In addition, the Stavka ordered the Volga military district to form an entirely new army 150 kilometers north of Stalingrad on the eastern bank of the Volga. This was Lieutenant General Kalinin's 66th Army, with eight rifle divisions and three tank brigades. Once it was formed, it would head southwest to reinforce the Soviet lines facing Wietersheim's corps. So clearly, the pressure was mounting on Paulus' army. And, as we will see in the next episode, his army was not up to the task it now faced. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.